Without further ado, Jane. Good morning. It, it's always such a treat to uh, make it out to the Eastern Shore, living over on the Western Shore. It's really, it was a beautiful drive over today. So thank you all for, uh, for coming out on such a chilly day. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Kate for having me back again. Um, I spoke last year on a, another house that I'm relatively familiar with, the Baltimore Harbor Lighthouse. And this year, I thought I'd uh, take the, the story a little further back in time to uh, work that I've been doing as part of the Anne Arundel County's Cultural Resources Program and um, give you a little bit of a, a background first on how it is that a grown woman plays in the dirt for a living and gets paid for it. Um, we, uh, with the Lost Towns Project, it's a cooperative program that was created about 20 years ago with Anne Arundel County in the Planning and Zoning Department. Um, our office, and technically my day job, is to do development review, but as a part of that, we've been really fortunate to have the support of the county to develop a research program that has um, really turned into a rediscovery of the, the past in Anne Arundel County, and much of that has been based on the archaeological work of the team of um, private consultants, archaeologists, and historians that make up the Lost Towns Project. Um, the, the program includes uh, not only the research, but we also do quite a bit of public outreach, and I'll be making a pitch later for uh, anyone that wants to come play in the dirt with me when the, the weather finally breaks and we get a shovel in the dirt. So what I'm going to be sharing with you today has really been information that's been learned over the last 20 years from historical archaeology. Historical archaeology is essentially the study of the, the of material culture that's been left behind by people after the buildings fall down. And by looking at the material culture, looking at the uh, historic documents, um, we're able to essentially reconstruct the past and the, the structures that used to be there and the things that happened on that site using the, this combination, this, this research. In the past 20 years, uh, much of our focus with the, uh, with the Lost Towns Project and the, where it got its name um, began with the discovery of archaeological sites from the 17th century in Providence. Providence was the first settlement in Anne Arundel County. Um, there were uh, dissident Puritans that came up from Virginia and from St. Mary's. And in 1649, they settled on the banks of the Severn River, the Whitehall Bay, and essentially formed the, the community that would one day become that capital city of Annapolis we all know today. But for 50 years before Annapolis was the capital city, there was a rich and vibrant community, and none of that survives above the ground. It's only beneath the ground and in the archival records. So what I wanted to start with today is a, a bit of a, um, a, 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 a history lesson on um, the, the settlement of the area so that you can get some context when I start talking about the archaeological sites and some of the historic buildings that we found that are beneath the ground. And um, I wanted to start with just thinking a little bit about who were these people that showed up in 1650 and settled in Anne Arundel County. Any guesses? We have Puritans, yeah? What, what were they here for? Religious reasons. Religious, yeah. Any others? Opportunity. Opportunity. They wanted to make a quick buck. Indeed. So we have a, an interesting community starting to build in 1650 and through that last 50 years of the 17th century. We have um, certainly people who are here for religious reasons. Um, the religious freedom of Maryland uh, allowed um, for, uh, for Protestants to come here and practice freely. Um, there were planters and farmers. People were coming from England because they heard, they got word that this was the land of opportunity. There was a place where they could come, plant a tobacco crop, and make incredible money. So the idea was that they were really kind of show up here to, um, you know, show up, plant their tobacco crops for a few years, make their bank, and then go back home with all their riches. So in a lot of instances, a lot of these folks were not planning on sticking around for a while. We also, of course, have the, the colonial elite, those people that showed up, the, the second son of a rich guy from England showed up here and he wanted to start a, you know, start, start a new world because he didn't have those opportunities in, in uh, his home country. And then we have the people that didn't say have as much of a, of a um, say in what, what was going on when they showed up. We have indentured servants. These are the people that came over. They essentially sold themselves for seven years or 10 years and said that if, if you get me over here, I'll work for you for seven years, 
And then I hopefully will again have this massive opportunity of actually owning land, of having control over my own destiny. Something that coming from England, they would have no chance of. And then of course you have the slave population, which by about 1670 started making up a huge population of Anne Arundel County and the colonial Chesapeake. So a few fun facts that will actually have quite a bit of bearing on what the buildings looked like when they started putting up homes in 1650. Um, so th think about the, uh, the implications of this. Um, for every woman in the colonies, there were three men. That is called fantastic opportunity if you're a woman in the colonies. Um, I love some of the stories I've read. Some of these women are married like four and five times. And there's, there's one woman that I've been doing a bit of research on, um, Elizabeth Thurston. She shows up, she's 19 years old. By the time she gets through her, she, she barely has anything. By the time she gets to her fourth husband, she marries the richest man in Maryland. She, she made it, she figured it out. And, and that's the kind of thing that if you're a woman in the colonial Chesapeake, if you can stay alive and not die from disease or childbirth, you're in a really good spot. So um, the population in the Chesapeake, because there were so few women, it was never self-sustaining. It took a really long time for the population to do anything more than just stay level. So uh, again, if you think about the implications of if, if you know, somebody doesn't have anything to look forward to, if they think they're gonna die in five or 10 years, what implications might that have for the type of building or the type of home that they might construct? So with so many of them, knowing that they had a low life ex expectancy, knowing that they had the opportunity to make money and get out, there was a real fluidity to the Chesapeake uh, colonial society between 1650 and 1700, which is the type of building, the, the era of buildings that I'm gonna be talking about. So the next question then is what does this kind of cultural um, experience, this, this social reality, what impact does this have on what type of building these folks are going to, to build? And that's what the archeology span has shown us over the last 20 years is that it's a, a little bit of a, a, a different approach to how you build your home. Okay, here's the first quiz of the day. Which house do you think is more likely in the year 1660? Yeah. So, not the beautiful brick structures that if you look in Colonial Williamsburg, if you read any history book, all you really hear about are these wonderful brick structures, these fantastic elite buildings. The reality is that that was rare, that was the Bill Gates, that was not the common person, that was not the middle or lower class, that's not how they lived. In fact, these are more typical of the structures that they lived in. Um, very simple buildings, post and ground, um, very little insulation. If they were lucky, they had a brick uh, fireplace or a brick chimney. In many instances, what we found from the archeology span is that the chimneys were made of what's called waddle and daub. Um, it's essentially a woven, um, woven wood strips that are covered in mud. And then they use it as a fireplace. You can see the inherent problem with having a wooden fireplace. And in fact, what we found in a couple of these sites is evidence that they built the structure, they built their wooden chimney, and they had it camp just a little bit further back with a big pole holding it up. So that not if, but when it caught on fire, they didn't want to lose their house, they'd go out, they'd kick the post down, the chimney would fall down, and they'd build another one. They, they, they were prepared for this kind of thing. But if, you know, you go and look at a building today, it would seem kind of wrong to have a wooden fireplace. But this was something that they had to figure out a way to, to build a fireplace, be able to live comfortably in these small homes, but they didn't have the money or didn't care to put the resources towards the expense of importing brick or having the bricks made or, or purchasing them. So these are very much more, the, the, you know, these are the typical types of structures. Um, you have very simple one room build buildings. Um, 16 by 20 was kind of an average, um, an average size of building. Now, in Anne Arundel County, these are four of the oldest buildings. These are the four oldest buildings that survive in Anne Arundel County. What do you notice about the dates? We do not have any buildings that survive from the 17th century. 
There are a handful that have hints of being built possibly in 1698 or 1695, but there are no standing structures from that era between 1650 and 1700. And that is when archaeology comes into play. Um, these are, are certainly some of the, the most you know, beautiful buildings. These survive, they, they're wonderful to go visit, but they don't really give you the story of what the average person's life or home looked like in 1660 as, as a central date. Now, um, I'll note that Cedar Park, um, that has a date of 1700. There's been some dendrochronology where they use um, tree rings to date the building. This building on the inside has one post hole and bolt. It's a rotten post that held up one corner of the house. It was encased, the whole building was encased in brick in the mid 18th century, and this one post survives. And that post actually dates to the 17th century. So the core of what was once an earth fast building, this wooden um, you know, uh, uh, posting ground structure, survives on the inside of that brick encased structure. So, in fact, Cedar Park is considered the oldest building in Anne Arundel County. So, recognizing that there were these wonderful brick structures in, um, th throughout the Chesapeake, that uh, in the 1960s, 1970s, everyone was looking at that as the typical colonial um, environment. When colonial Williamsburg started being uh, reconstructed and recreated in the 1930s. All of the buildings that they started putting back up from that, that early 18th century time period were all brick. Now, in the mid 80s, uh, early 80s, um, there were several uh, architectural historians with Colonial Williamsburg that started working very um, tightly with archaeologists. And what this article, it was an absolute uh, turning point, a seminal point for understanding architecture in the Colonial Chesapeake, because it made the point that through archaeology, they recognized that there was a completely different building style, a building tradition that had really not been recognized before this, this uh, 1981 article. And in this article called Impermanent Architecture in the Southern Colonies, finally put on paper what people for about 10 years had been learning, that most of the buildings in the Colonial Chesapeake were not beautiful brick structures with big brick foundations, but they were based on post and ground structures. And this is the idea of the typical type of 17th century building that was common throughout the uh, Colonial Chesapeake. It wasn't a brick structure, it was essentially a pole barn. And this is what most people lived in. So what you can see here are a pattern of post holes. Um, we've got a plan view, and this is what we start to find archeologically. We find a plan view that has the original post hole that was dug, dug out with a shovel. There's a dark center in the middle that is actually the rotten post from when they put the post in the ground to erect the building. Now, um, and this is a, um, a essentially cut down the center. You can see how the post hole comes down. It might have what we call a step to it to make it easier to get a big post in and lean the post in and then pop it up. And what we find archeologically are the, the stains, the leftover stains, incredibly subtle. Sometimes you have to stare at it for a couple of hours to finally see it emerge, or you get it wet with a spritzer. But these are the ephemeral remnants of what the building stru the structures looked like in the uh, 17th century Chesapeake. So by going back then and oops, carefully mapping the location of post holes and post molds, on most archaeological sites where we're looking at a 17th century structure, we can actually, this is the fun part, play connect the dots, and we can find out the construction, the size, the, the, um, the, you know, what, what this building may have looked like on the ground. And then we use the artifacts that we find to better understand what it may have looked like above the ground. So, the earth-fast architecture concept is what is absolutely critical to understanding 17th century architecture in the Chesapeake. Um, it's a posting ground building. Sometimes they didn't even bother building, um, digging a hole. They would just lay a sill down and build up off of that. Now, um, we live in the colonial Chesapeake where Orkin has a really good business going. And really, a business, a, 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 a structure, if they were lucky, would last 20 years. And the termites would get it. 
So there were a few tech, um, technical ways that they, they tried to slow the termites down, but we will oftentimes, for a building that was occupied more than that 20-year ballpark, we'll find evidence in the ground of them digging out a post, pulling it out, and replacing it. And it actually ends up looking like Mickey Mouse ears because they had to dig underneath the building, propped it up for a while, and then put a new, new uh, post in to help support the building so that they could make it last more than 20 years. Now, the point of earth-fast architecture is that they're not putting a lot of resources into it. They have the money that they do have, they want to put into making their tobacco crops make the money. They're not trying to show off. There's nobody here really for them to show off to in most instances. So they're really just trying to get a basic structure that they can survive in, but it's not meant for a long game. It's meant to give them shelter so that they can make money and build on, on this, this opportunity that the Chesapeake provides. Now, there's a couple of documents that talk, um, that give recommendations for when somebody's going to go to the new world. And it actually describes the exact house that was shown on that previous um, slide with the, the, the Carson article, that, that earth vast structure. They called that the beginner's home. And it literally lays out the details in this historic document of exactly how you're supposed to build this, and it's not going to take you very long. You should be able to put this up in a few weeks, and you know this is where you, the type of wood you use. It gives this whole description of how to build your beginner's home when you show up in the Colonial Chesapeake. <coughs> the, the interesting part about this, the evolution of these buildings, is that it's completely in response to the really an environment that, that the folks that are showing up here had never experienced for before. You've got incredible changes in temperature, as we're witnessing today and the last few days. Um, you've got incredibly humid summers. You've got to find out a way to make this building survive, to make it be comfortable, to at least you know, be a habitable space. And we see innovations and technological changes in the, the 17th century architecture through the archaeology that we've done that shows how the buildings have evolved and changed and um, different materials might be used. They use different siding. They um, start to figure out new techniques for making the buildings last longer. So it's really a, a back and forth with the architecture of the time. The building that they might have constructed in 1650 evolved and changed over the 50 years until we finally get to the 18th century where you've got third generation settlers essentially. These people have pretty much figured out they're not going home again. So now in the 18th century, you know, that, that's when they finally settle in and say, okay, we're gonna start putting something more. We've got the resources now, we've made a couple bucks on tobacco, we've got the stability of the society. We're gonna start building something more permanent. And so that's where the notion of impermanent architecture comes from, and that's what earth vast buildings throughout the Colonial Chesapeake represent. So with, with that uh, little background on the origins of earth vast architecture and what, what that means, um, what I'm going to do now is give you a little tour of what the 17th century colonial Anne Arundel County looked like. Um, now, as I pointed out before, nothing's still standing. So any of the images that you see of a structure being, you know, a, a structure above ground has been reconstructed 3D imaging, um, architectural renderings based on the archeological discoveries. In Anne Arundel County, we have about 27, 28 possibly, um, uh, pre-1700 pre sites dating from that 1650 to 1700 time period. Now, if you do the math on this, there were about 4,000 people at the turn of the 17th, 18th century. Um, an average household size in the Chesapeake was very small, only about three people. Um, you start to do the math on that. We've only found 27 sites. Where are the other 2,000 or so in Anne Arundel County? This is called job security. I need to find them. <laughs> So what we have been very fortunate with, though, is to find uh, several clusters. I mentioned um, Providence being the first settlement um, in 1649, and this is the cluster um, that we call the, the settlement of Providence. We have um, London Town, which some of you may have heard of. Um, historic London Town was founded in 1684. Um, it was actually founded by an act of General Assembly. They decided that they really needed a town where they could tell everybody to ship their tobacco so that the government could, guess this, collect taxes. 
Um, so London Town is a real, uh, you know, a real concentration of 17th century architecture. And then in the recent years, we've been finding additional clusters of 17th century um, occupation in southern Anne Arundel County. We've got a, a real cluster in the Galesville um, West River Road River area that uh, was really a hot spot. Some of the wealthiest uh, 17th century citizens um, set up camp in, in that area. Uh, very easy water access. It had fantastic access to the agricultural um, assets. R really great place to, uh, to settle in. And then we're also finding evidence for a short-lived but very intense occupation in the 17th century in the town of Harrington, also dating to about 1660, 1670. Um, it went away fairly quick because uh, erosion filled in the harbor and they could no longer effectively get ships in and out. But in that fleeting moment of the you know, 10, 20, 30 years, there are remnants of a very active 17th century community there. If you drive out there today, it's woods and farmland and you would never guess that this actually used to be the hot spot in Ann Arbor County. So I want to start out now by, by um, giving you a, a little bit of um, the, the real world of what we see in the ground. What, what do these buildings look like and how is it that we've you know, brought ourselves to understand um, that, that these structures uh, look like this and, and how, how they operated. Um, Providence was a fairly tightly clustered, um, essentially a, a hamlet type town. Um, instead of a main street, they used Whitehall Bay. They used the rivers as their main streets. That's how people got around in the colonial Chesapeake, and the waterways are very important. What we found is that the cluster of 17th century sites, these dwelling houses, really seem to follow these, what we call main streets, or maybe, maybe this is, this is a, Second Street, and that's Third Street. But the idea is that this was their their um, you know venue of getting around, and we find these 17th century sites almost like clockwork at about 10 feet above mean sea level, next to a spring head, and within about 200 feet of a navigable um, course of water. So you think it would be pretty easy to find some of these. Um, we, we've we've nailed a couple of them, but we still know that there's a few other hot spots that we'd love to go dig. Um, some of them, unfortunately, already have a mansion on them, um, but we've, in some instances, found sites right next to an active, you know, uh, subdivision, that, that type of thing. So, um, what I'm going to do now is tell you a little bit about some of these sites. Um, these, when, when we find these, um, we find a concentration of artifacts, usually, that are either noticed above the ground, or um, they're found by doing what's called a shovel test it survey. We dig um, a, a small hole about 18 inches around, we screen the soil, and we plot out where the artifact concentrations are located. So often we'll find in that initial survey work architectural remnants. We're going to find a lot of brick. We're going to find, um, sometimes we'll, we'll find the actual stains in the ground where um, the, the posts were. Or, as importantly, and this is where the really interesting part of the, this archaeology comes from, we find trash-filled pits. They would have cellars underneath the floorboards of their house that they would use essentially like a root cellar. It, that was their refrigeration of the 17th century. Now, when they were done with their root cellar and no longer needed it for keeping their, their vegetables um, cool or for storage, they would very nicely fill it in with trash because the trash truck wasn't going to come by and, uh, and take care of their trash. So these are the, the wonderful little sealed capsules that tell us so much about the people that lived there, what they ate, um, how, how they lived, what their, their houses looked like when we start looking at the nuances of these tiny little shirts. The, these artifacts are what provides a context to not just seeing a 16 by 20 wooden building, but we can start to drape all of this information over and start to see buildings come up out of the earth. And in many ways, it's in our imagination. But when we start looking back at, at uh, you know, examples of ceramics that are complete from the little fragments that we find, the uh, types of architectural materials, we can start to get a really good sense for what their, their houses look like and what their daily lives might have been like. So window glass. Not all of the houses, and in fact, not very many, had windows. They often just had shuttered doors. So when we find window glass, that's giving us a hint that maybe they were doing pretty well for themselves. 
Um, we find different types of nails, which help us identify dates through time. Um, different nails, wrought nails were used very early with rose, head, um, rose heads on them. And we look at the progression of the nail types and we can often identify changes in construction or changes in um, or additions uh, to, to a house. We find um, mortar and plaster. Um, they would have done a, a mortar um, or a plaster on the interiors of their house to you know, give them a little bit more brightness and light so that they, they would be, be more habitable. Um, we find brick scatters, which often hint at where the hearth might have been or where the fire fireplace may have been. And another artifact that's really cool that we, we find on a lot of these sites is something called window webs, which I will get to in a few minutes. Now, the artifacts beyond these architectural elements can also start to tell us about what the interior of the building looked like and what the um, what what they were doing in the building in the different parts. So um, things like curtain rings are going to tell us that they had a really nice interior. If they have curtain rings, they clearly would have had curtains. Curtains aren't going to survive in the archaeological record. Very rarely do we find a little written note that says, you know, oh, I put up a beautiful set of curtains in my living room today. So the curtain rings, we have to take that small piece of information. If we find a cluster in a certain area, we can say, okay, this room that we've identified probably was very well appointed. It was very decorative. Um, we find um, hinges and hasps. These are going to be things that tell us where the doors were or where the shuttered windows might have been. Now, we get into other um, ar archaeologically recovered items, um, things like pipe stems. What we do when we find a certain type of artifact, we add up the numbers that we find across the site and we try to do a distribution map. We show where the high concentrations are compared to the areas that you don't find certain artifacts. Pipe stems, for example, often tend to cluster right next to a main doorway or a back doorway. The idea here is that when you're sitting on the back step on a hot Chesapeake day, think about those hot Chesapeake days right now, um, say you're, you know, whittling something or resting after a long day's work, just like, say, 20 years ago when everyone smoked, not now, um, you'd be smoking your tobacco pipe, and that's the most likely spot that your tobacco pipe is going to be broken or parts that are going to be broken off and drop. So when we find a concentration of tobacco pipes or pipe stems, that gives us a hint as to where a door might have been. Um, likewise, um, if we find a lot of faunal remains of bone, um, if we find chopped up bone, if we find remnants of an animal being butchered, if we find burnt animal bone, what do you think that's going to tell us? The kitchen, right. Um, with, uh, same with you know, certain cooking utensils or vessels. Um, there were certain types of ceramic vessels that were generally used in serving end of things, in the fancy dining room, as, as it were, for the time. You'd have a certain type of, you know, a very light uh, earthenware, something that's decorative, painted, something that was meant more as a showpiece. In the working area of the house, you're going to have a really robust, um, you know, some, some sort of lead glazed earthenware that's going to be thick and chunky and used for actually preparing meals. It's going to be a hardier type of, of ceramic. So if we plot out different artifact, um, you know, locations like that we can start to figure out, was that the cooking area, the work area, the kitchen, versus the area where that they were dining or having tea. So these are the types of little pieces of information that start to, you weave them together, and soon you have an entire world coming up out of the ground. I'm hoping that the lighting is gonna work on that. Um, for the next couple of slides, can we turn maybe this light off to just sure. help uh, with some of it? Um, this is uh, th this is going to be a little tough to see, but this is really just what it's like out in the field when it's really sunny out, and you're trying to find stains in the ground. With 17th century architecture, this is literally what we've got to work with. We've got stains in the ground, we've got concentrations of artifacts. As we carefully dig down through the soil, we dig in layers, so if we see a change in artifact concentration or the soil changes color, we stop, we clean it off, and this is where you, you see like National Geographic with little trowels and spoons and whatnot. This is the time when we pull the spoons out. And what we start to find as we open up larger areas are architectural features that give us, give us the hints as to where the building was. So in this upper picture, does anybody see the fireplace?
You see it now? See the brick? There, there's the, the smallest fragments of brick chunks in that area, and that's to, and, and in a U shape that's about 10 feet wide of, of uh, brick scatter. And that is telling us where this fireplace and where this, um, this building was located. We also found, um, and there's no way you can see it in this picture, but at the corners here, we found very faint post holes. These stains in the ground where the posts were, were one, the post holes were dug out and the stain of the post was located. Um, so it's, it's definitely tough on the eyes some days. So this is a mass of, uh, this is a major excavation that we did. Um, it, it's at a property actually that's located within spitting distance of Route 50, um, right as you pit past the Bay Bridge. Um, it's on private property. And um, this was, uh, this site was identified, homeless lot was identified as part of a development project. Somebody came in and said, we're, we're, we want to build a house here. And as part of my role with Anne Arundel County, we can require that they do archaeological studies to make sure that there's nothing historically significant. If there is something historically significant, like a massive archaeology site in their backyard, what we work, do is work with the owner or the developer and try to protect the site in, in, in situ. We basically try to, we try to get a protected easement so that it can't be disturbed and would be available for future excavation or future study. In this instance, um, we ended up getting a easement line that was right about here and went that way. There's a pool here right now. It's a lovely pool overlooking Whitehall Bay. Um, but we were able to preserve all of these archaeological features. Now, with Homewood's Lot, what we um, ended up getting here was a 1650 structure, which was the building that I just showed you with the, the fireplace. And then we have 300 years of continuous occupation. On this site, we were able to delineate the 17th century part of the occupation by finding this little fire, fireplace. This was actually the entire house. When they first got here, what we call the hit the beach house, this is the building they put up for the first five or six years that they lived here. We know that Homewood, um, when, when they first arrived, there were about five or six people in their um, household now, there may have been some other structures, but for the most part, based on the artifacts that we found, this looks like it was sort of, you know, home central for the first five or six years that they, they lived on this property. Now, over time, they added another fireplace structure, so it may have been kitchen related, it may have been a dwelling house, um, a lot of faunal material, a lot of um, animal bone, and burnt evidence of burn um, up in this area. So by the time the 17th century comes to a close, we think that this property had two 17th century buildings, and this black line shows the, the extent of where we found 17th century material. Now, the 18th century comes along, and this, is a perf this site's a perfect example of how the, the sites would evolve and how the buildings would be used and adapted and, and revised over time. And what we end up with is a later 18th century brick structure. We find um, the earliest, uh, the, this two-sided fireplace is the earliest dairy, or earliest uh, wash house laundry in the, um, in the colonial Maryland archeological record. There's one that's comparable in time to uh, in uh, Virginia, but this was one of the earliest dairies. You start to see, uh, or um, laundry, sorry. Um, you start to see a, a you know, real density of buildings. At one point on this site, um, the area that you see here, we've got a document in 1714 that describes over 20 structures. Now, archaeologically, this becomes a little tough, but we are happy to say that we feel like we have a good handle on the 17th century structures. Okay, here's another example of one of these hit the beach houses. The very first structure that's put up when they show up in 1650 and they've, they've got to have somewhere to live. This is an example of, the, and actually the first 17th century site we found in um, Providence. This is called the Broadneck site. Um, and what we found here, that this was done in the uh, very early 90s before there were like lots of computer stuff that we used. So this is a hand-drawn map showing the outline of the building based on the, sh the uh, post holes that we identified. And fortunately, what we found here was a large cellar hole filled with trash. Now, we start to think about this structure. It, it can't, can't be more than you know, 10 by 16, um, very tiny. There's a shallow cellar. Um, it's, it's a tiny, very 
unassuming house that these folks are living in. Now, out of the cellar hole, this is what the type of material that came out of it. What are they doing with this plate if they don't have money to do anything else but build a shack? It really is a, a, a discontinuity between what their material culture looked like and what their housing stock looked like. So these are things that make you really think about what life and what their outlook was like in the 17th century. They weren't going to put their money into a house, but this plate would have been incredibly expensive. Um, other items that we find of uh, concentration of, um, of uh, tobacco pipes, these are all a terracotta pipe, which was very common early in the 17th century. Um, and these are all probably pipes that were made here in, in the States as opposed to being shipped from England. The English pipes tend to be white. Um, we found evidence, obviously, of them trying to clear the land. We've got a, uh, an axe head and a key. Now, a key indicates that somebody had something to lock up and protect. So is it a key to their 10 foot by 10 foot house? Was it a key to a chest where they kept their valuable goods? Who were they protecting their stuff from? It really starts, a, a key is a really interesting question when you're looking at a, a property that's, that, you know, that there's nobody that's living around you. What are they protecting? Unanswered questions. Okay, here, here's a, um, another site within the Providence complex. Um, this site is actually, you can see some uh, towers behind on Greenberry Point towers that you can see as you cross the uh, Chesapeake Bay. This was discovered by um, the Navy Seabees with a tractor and a backhoe. Um, they cut through the middle of a 17th century cellar hole when they were building the um, ice rink over there. And um, what we identified here was an entire building that had burnt, a 17th century building, earth fast, that had burnt and collapsed into this, this huge cellar hole that was underneath the structure. So here we have a really interesting, this is about 1670 that it got filled. Um, we, we have really interesting, like, in time, they, they couldn't save anything out of that cellar before everything fell in on top of it. So we get a perfect little time capsule of what did they keep in their cellar hole in 1670. Um, I'm sad to say there was a dog. Uh, we, we were able to um, excavate the, the dog that perished in the fire. Um, but we also found a, a real, um, it, it just a, a treasure trove of, of this, you know, time capsule, which was really helpful in understanding the, you know, what their, their homes looked like, what kind of things they kept in their homes. This is a, uh, a drawing of that profile wall, that sliced, um, that, that slice of it. And you can see that this was fire modeled, there's burnt planking from the floorboards, filled with ash and destruction. This was all brick, probably from um, part of the structure. And then this is all soil that's just fallen in over the 300 years since. Now, out of that cellar hole, we found these exquisite yellow and green tiles that are of Dutch origin. What we found at Providence is an, a real density of Dutch colonial material culture. Now, um, a quick, quick history lesson. The English were kind of possessive about their colonies, and they didn't want the Dutch trading with the English colonists because they wanted to try to keep all, all control of all of the money. Um, what we find in Providence, these guys are renegades. They were trading with the Dutch left and right. We have found so much Dutch material culture in Providence, and you don't see it anywhere else in the Chesapeake. So they were so far away from the, the central command of St. Mary City, we think that the Dutch ships were just rolling up to the dock and selling all their, their Dutch stuff, and they had Dutch friends. So they, they were completely avoiding um, all these rules that the government had set, saying you're not allowed to trade with the Dutch. They didn't really care, it turns out. And this is something that nobody's going to write down. I'm breaking the law. I'm trading with the Dutch. That's not something you're ever going to see in the historical written record. But the predominance of Dutch material that we find throughout Providence tells a completely different story about how they were acquiring their goods. Just a few uh, creeks over is Burley's Town Land. This is the home of Robert Burley. He was um, the surveyor for Anne Arundel County. He's the guy that if you needed a land patent, he signed the bottom of the paperwork. Um, very high up in the colonial government, um, this you know, very new colonial government in 1650. 
And at his house, as we excavated, the house just kept getting it longer and longer and longer. Um, every time we go out and we'd open up a new section, we first started out and said, oh, this makes perfectly good sense. We, we had um, just uh, this half of it, and we are like, okay, we've got a fireplace, it's 16 feet wide, it's 24 feet long, this fits the mold. The next season we came back and we dug over here, and the house kept going. And then the next season, we dug over here, and the house just kept going. So we had to start looking at why did this break the mold, if you will, of this typical 17th century you know, hovel, this little you know, uh, building that, that they were just making do with. And what we really come up with with Robert Burley is that he is at the upper echelon of the society. He's got the money to, to um, show off, and he wants to show off. So he's going to great efforts to put more wealth into, you know, showing more of his wealth in his built environment. Because he's the, the surveyor, he's keeping official government records. People are coming to his house as if they would to a court or some sort of public space. There is no public court in Providence for the first 20 years, so it's very likely that Robert Burley's house is where you went to do government business. And that starts to make sense with the structure that we found. As we find a fence here, this is pointing towards several of other of um, what would be considered quasi-public buildings, a ferry, um, a meeting house where they would, would gather for religion, or for religious services, and the all-important tavern. So that side had a very different um, complex of artifacts. The things that we found on that side of the house looked very different from the artifacts that were more domestic in nature that we found over in this area. So by looking at those nuances of where the artifacts were located, looking at the architecture, we've been able to identify not just the home of Robert Burley, but also a very important early government building. This is a rendering that um, we, we had an intern work on a few years back to try to start to get a sense of what did the interior look like. Um, and so you can see the, uh, the you know, typical types of, of furniture that they may have had, you know, fairly simple, sparse environment on the interior, but he was putting a lot of effort into what his house would have looked like. Things that we found here included Dutch yellow brick. Uh, these are really tight, uh, um, very, very small, um, hard packed yellow bricks that were often brought over as ballast in ships because they didn't absorb water the same way that um, the red brick did. So Dutch yellow brick is something that we found throughout the, the Burley site, um, indicating that he may have used them as dec for decorative purposes in his fireplace. Again, you know, trying to show off. People were in his house looking at if, you know, what he had, so he wanted to put his best foot forward. And you can see um, some of the examples in these uh, Dutch genre paintings of how yellow bricks would have been incorporated into the, the, with the red brick. We also found um, tons of roofing pan tile. He didn't just cover his structure with um, thatch or with uh, wooden shingles. He went to, the, this is not cheap. Roof and pan tiles like this um, that you can see again in this Dutch genre painting, this is very typical of, of um, the, the, you know, of a high style construction. And we found several of them at uh, Burley's Townland site. Fireplace tiles. Again, these are really high end. Now, everything I said about being, you know, small, tiny, not fancy places, this is the exception to the rule for our 17th century, but it's cool stuff, so I thought I had to share it with you. So these are um, typical, uh, Dutch, again, these are Dutch tiles with Dutch drawings, Dutch motifs on them. Um, the one that we found at Burley, this corner with this leg, we've uh, um, found evidence that, that it's very likely from this series of 17th century tiles, um, which they call a pikeman motif, but basically a military motif. Okay, earlier I mentioned that we find something called window leads. So at one site that we worked on in the West River Road River area, we found 32 window leads. And window leads are essentially the little pieces of, of lead that hold tiny casement window panes in place. So you can see one um, shown in, you know, in, in place. Now, window leads are really awesome to find because if you are lucky enough to find the right, right section of it, what they were required to do in England is take, um, basically take credit for if they were gonna make this lead item, they had to do, make sure that it was um, reached a certain level of purity for the government to check on it, they had to label it with their name or their initials, 
and when they, they made the window lid. And they were required to stamp that in to the window lid about every 10 to 12 inches. So when we are really lucky on a site, we actually get the date in print as to when that building went up, or within a few years at least. At this site, we found several that had a WM and a star and then the date 1671. So talk about just being handed on a silver platter when the building went up, when there's no other evidence. We, it, it's like a little message from the past that says, oh, well, your building was constructed in 16, after 1671. Incredibly wonderful when we find those. Um, at, so at Sparrow's Rest, the site that's, um, it's actually on the, uh, the um, Smithsonian Environmental Research Center on the Road River, um, this site had 32 of these window leads. And that tells us that the house was probably on the fancier side with having all these lead casement windows. <coughs> now, this is the site. You will notice the large brick uh, ruins in the background. This would be the 18th century building. Being the Lost Towns project, those you know, 18th century ruins, eh, whatever. So we started digging in the front yard, and what we found was a massive complex from the 1670s. This was the first place that the Sparrows built their, they started to build their empire. They became incredibly wealthy, incredibly um, successful, and we found a complex of uh, amazing pits filled with trash, pits filled with um, architectural material. The, the collection from this site is, is just a, an absolute treasure trove. And uh, here's an example again of just, the, it was an earth fast building, but in this instance, they did have enough money to do at least a brick lining for their fireplace. Now that one's easy to see, right? You can see that one. <laughs> now, the thing that we found here, um, it was this was really easy to tell. These are the post holes. See the little dark spot in the middle? Here's another post hole, dark spot in the middle. And we found this you know, perfectly you know, lined up, and th this one was easy. Um, we also found two uh, pits in front of the fireplace, only on one side, and it had a clay division that had never been dug into before. So they didn't have just one shelf of their underground refrigerator, they had two shelves. They had the shelf near the fire to make sure everything stayed nice and warm, then they had an another pit, another storage pit set slightly further back. <coughs> And this is what we ended up mapping, mapping in. Um, you can see these, this post hole complex, the, uh, where the pits ended up being located. And this is the structure that we were able to infer from those archaeological uh, hints. We, we have a building that, again, it's about 16 feet, by, uh, 16 feet wide. And this is actually in two, um, it, it has two rooms in it. It's called a hall and parlor plan, which is fairly common. Okay, we're going to keep going south and get to the very southern tips of Anne Arundel County now and talk about, um, about Harrington. This is a little complex of 17th century sites that I mentioned earlier on that are in the very south end, on the um, very top end of Herring Bay. And at Harrington, we know that there was a town there because there's ar uh, ar um, there, there are archival records that talk about the town of Harrington, lots of, of references to that. Fortunately today, now you would think this is where, as an archaeologist, our job would be really easy. Well, you just go down Town Point Road to Town Point, and you should find a town, right? Maybe? Not so easy. So we, um, about uh, 10 years ago, we started a search for the town of Harrington. Um, this is all open rural land. There's not a lot of construction that's gone on. We thought our odds were pretty high that it hadn't been destroyed uh, beforehand by construction. So we started um, what turned out to be a 600 um, shovel test pit survey. We dug 600 individual pits along this entire landscape that you see here. And finally, we found a few tiny fleeting uh, hints of the 17th century. And we were, maybe it's dumb luck, but we opened up just a few uh, excavation units, larger excavation units, and we found a post hole that had 17th century artifacts in it. So this starts to help us flesh out where perhaps the town center was. Um, it's a, 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 a horse pasture, so they weren't really keen on us opening up too many more holes and breaking their horses' legs. 
So this is as much as we've been able to do, but we do know that it's very unlikely that it's going to be disturbed. Um, it's something that holds a lot of research potential. We have a good sense that there was something there in the 17th century, so we, we got, um, we, you know, mission accomplished to a certain extent. Okay. Um, now I'm going to move on to London Town, London Town um, which is uh, founded in 1684. London Town is um, a seaport, a colonial seaport, very prominent for quite a few years. It was actually, it rivaled the city of Annapolis. It was a bigger seaport than the city of Annapolis. And in that town, it's really one of the, the few concentrated areas of 17th century architecture. We are really fortunate in that the county owns 26 acres of the original 100-acre farm, and, or 100-acre uh, port. And what we've been able to do over the last 20 years is do um, a ton of public education. We've had um, thousands upon thousands of fourth and fifth graders come through and dig with us as we've been rediscovering the colonial seaport. And at London Town, we've been able to take it to the next level so that we don't just have to imagine these 17th century buildings in our minds or in a three-dimensional rendering, but at London Town, they have taken on the effort of actually rebuilding the structures so that people can go in and experience what a 17th century building looked like, it felt like, how people lived in it. We have an operating hearth in one of them. We do uh, cooking um, demonstrations. And when you walk into some of the, this structure, for example, um, this is actually right around 1700. It's one of the, the later um, 17th century buildings. Um, a very simple structure. Uh, you can see the methodology here of how they, they raised the, um, raise the side walls and the whole construction. We actually have this really cool um, a time lapse video of the whole thing going up and sort of you know, in, in, in speed, but the, the memory on the computer would explode, I think. Um, so what, what we see here, though, is what was a fairly typical in-town 17th century structure. Um, we know that there were no, was no window glass, so the building only has these uh, shuttered um, doors. We found a concentration of tobacco pipes in this area, so we figured, okay, well, that needs to be a door. There were also two post holes really close to each other, indicating where a door structure might be. Um, we have the uh, fireplace here. This is one of those wooden chimneys with just dog cover on the inside, the, the brick clay cover. And um, in this area on the ground, we found a you know, incredibly hot red burnt area of soil. So based on the archeology span and working with some um, of the, the uh, architectural historians from Colonial Williamsburg, we put together this, this drawing of you know, what did this building look like? And then London Town took on the, the not enviable task of rebuilding it using all original techniques um, from, from the time period, the proper type of wood. It was a multi-year process. Now, they had so much fun doing that that they did another one. Um, right next door to uh, the Lord Vader's tenement that I just showed you was the carpenter shop. Now, um, the carpenter shop, um, you, you've, you've seen this story before, right? We, we find the post holes. We start to find areas where there's fire and burn. Um, these are inter intermediary post holes that would have held the structure um, up. Now, with this building, um, we found that um, the, the architects of Colonial Williamsburg said, you know, it's too long, it's too wide. The building would not have stood up if it had just had one long expanse. So they had to get creative and, and did what they call an M roof, which was um, a fairly controversial decision for them to reconstruct it with what's called an M roof that you'll see in a minute. Now, what was really compelling about this site, when we first located it, um, the land records indicated that it was the carpenter shop of a gentleman named Stephen West. Um, as a carpenter shop in town, we would have expected to find blacksmithing materials, we would have expected to find you know, uh, items that would have shown us a carpenter shop operation. What we found instead was a, quite a bit of, um, architect or, or of uh, a domestic material indicating that there were people living here. But it wasn't very high-end domestic material. It was the cheapest ceramics. It was mismatched items. And then we found a post hole that we couldn't explain in the center of the building, which ended up being a child's burial. This burial, we, we found a six, um, six teeth and the faintest outline of the skull. This is as far as we excavated. We stopped excavation and um, ended up uh, reburying it and started doing research. We know that Stephen West, who owned this structure, um, 
he was a huge importer of slaves from Barbados. We found a reference in this book called Plantation Slavery in Barbados. It's a, a description of a property owner in Barbados that um, found that his slave cabins were down in the swampy area, it was unhealthy. He built all new slave cabins and he couldn't figure out why his slaves would not go to their new accommodations. They were so much more lovely. And then he goes into why, when I mean, he found out why they wouldn't leave. The um, West African tradition, if a child was under a certain age and died, it had to be buried underneath where the mother slept to protect its soul. The child couldn't go on to the afterlife in the same way that a mature, um, a, a, you know, more mature child could. So based on that report of the, the ch child's burial and the reason that the mother would not move out, she was protecting her, her um, dead child, what we start to see here with the burial and the way that this building is structured, we have interpreted this as being an area where slaves were, were housed. This was their home. This is where they actually slept. And that is being reconstructed, fi finalizing the roof as we speak. Um, you can see an early digital rendering of what we thought it might look like. Um, Colonial Williamsburg got involved and set us straight and turned it around a bit to the streetscape. But essentially what we're looking at here is a two-part building. You've got the back part that was likely used for housing slaves, and we've got the front part that was more, most likely used for more of the, um, the uh, uh, carpenter shop activities, so the business end of the thing. Okay, one final building from, um, from uh, London Town is what we call Rumner, Rumney's Tavern. Um, the building you see in the back is from the 1760s. Right when the town is sort of you know, going by the wayside, the tobacco market's crashed, the Annapolis is flourishing, there's no reason for London Town to be here. This guy, William Brown, shows up and builds a mansion and makes himself bankrupt in the process because he's banking on the former glory of what was a major seaport. In that major seaport, right next door, was a tavern, an earth fast building, that um, operated from about 1690 until 1725. What you see here is using tree stumps, we were trying to get a visual of how the building would have filled the space. Using the tree stumps, you can start to see the outline of the structure. And you see this grassy area here. That ended up being a cellar, hill, cellar hole filled with just fantastic trash from a wild Saturday night. Um, <laughs> there were more, uh, more um, broken plates, and there were wine bottles, and there were faunal remains. We had a perfect snapshot of what a tavern would have been serving, what they would have been serving on, what type of foods. Oyster shells that were as big as my head. Um, uh, this was actually one of the first excavations. We did this about 20 years ago now. This is one of my first excavations um, that I was um, responsible for. The one thing I remember from, from this, which just talk about you know, putting you in touch with the past, these layers of um, oyster shell, one of them I uncovered. Have you all smelled oyster shell after they sat out for a bit, that oily smell? It was overwhelming when I uncovered that from 1725. And the smell lingered for about two hours. It was, it was, I wish there was like a smell, a way to document the smell. Um, it, I mean, it just, it puts you so close and in touch with what, you know, what the past is about. Um, but within this, we, we just found an, an incredible treasure trove. Um, just a few weeks ago, based on the archeology, span um, on the plans, uh, Colonial Williamsburg has just completed a rendering of what they're saying that we should reconstruct the building to look like. Um, a few other, uh, th this is just a sampling of the wine bottles that we found. One of the wine bottles was actually um, sitting upright as I dug down through the dirt. You could see the, um, the wire top and the cork. I thought I had 17th century wine. It was, and then I you know, uncovered a little bit more and sure enough it was broken. But the, the fact that we still had the intact cork in, in place was pretty amazing. The other thing we found um, that uh, really surprised us about Rumney's Tavern, this is in a seaport. We'd expect it to be a rough and tumble. This is where the guys getting off the ship after being you know, at sea for four months would roll in. Instead, what we found in their material culture was not the evidence of the average guy you know, dr drinking after a long time at, at sea, 
but we found an incredibly high-end assemblage of um, some of the fanciest delf that was available at the time. And we found a very rare coffee pot. Tea was really popular at the time, but coffee had not caught on. Coffee houses in England in the 1720s were the cutting edge. And in 1724, here in little old backwater London town, they had a coffee pot, which indicates that they were incredibly connected with England. Okay, the final site, everybody says, what's the coolest thing you've ever found being an archaeologist? And we found it in the middle of a sod farm in Providence. The Levy Neck site, um, occupation according to some archival records suggests about, uh, started to be occupied about 1655, 1660. We go out, we found a concentration, the owner actually had uh, reported a concentration of artifacts on the surface, um, tobacco pipes that were the right time period, ceramics that were the right time period. And um, we go out and we open up an uh, excavation area and this is one of those wonderful cellar holes. We were, we were excited, but you know, this is about the fifth Providence site that we dug. Uh, you know, we, we're getting jaded. We're like another cellar hole from the 17th century. <laughs> so we, we started digging, you know, documenting it. And it it's, you know, wonderful, wonderful sample. We, we knew that the owner of the property was um, kind of in middling range. He wasn't really wealthy. He wasn't really poor. So that was going to add to our understanding of the, the, the range of Providence occupants. We had the rich people already. You remember Burley. You remember Town Neck. Um, so now we're kind of getting, you know, what's the average guy living? You know, how, how's his life? So we started digging the cellar hole. Um, the method we use, we, we uh, chop it into four pieces of pie. Uh, the theory being that we dig one quarter at a time, so if we screw that up, we can fix it on the next quarter. Um, started digging down through the, the layers of soil. Um, typical materials, we found a um, better part of a five point. Um, <laughs> We found um, scraffito. This is a, a you know pretty pretty fancy ceramic, um, monochrome delft. Uh, this is you know really beautiful little base to a bowl. Um, this was kind of neat. We found a uh, Susquehannock pipe. This is a pipe that would have had to have been directly traded with Native Americans. So we got a sense for you know who they were trading with and interacting with. And we are working down our way through. A couple of other cool things, um, back to that, that concept of sometimes they give you a date and hand it to you. We found a um, coin, both sides of the coin here, and it's got a beautiful little sailing ship on it, and this says Newport in the Isle of Wight. It's an island in the south of England. Um, 16 blank four. Okay, that's not nice. Um, we found some examples though that this uh, stamp was 1664, so we were able to use archival evidence to get back with that. So we had a really well-dated site. Um, we, we were you know, feeling pretty good about what we knew about this, and we were, we were getting a good image of what that, that um, life, you know, what their life looked like. A neat little, uh, neat little pot you can see coming up in, in uh, place there. And as we were digging down through one final section, there was a, um, a soil stain on the side of this that just never made sense to us. We kept keeping it separate and digging it down separately, but it was like this little lobe that was on the edge of the, edge of the uh, cellar hole, and you know, finding traditional, the same type of trash on top of it. And that is what was at the edge of the trash-filled cellar. Fully excavated. That is the coolest thing I've ever found. <laughs> so here's, here's the story. Um, we, we got the uh, Smithsonian involved, Doug Owsley, who is the um, genius that was behind the Written and Bone exhibit that was just recently closed at the Smithsonian Natural History Museum. He came out, um, helped us with the excavation, looking at some of these you know, incredible forensic details. This is where the, uh, you know, the, this um, show Bones came to life. The things that that guy could sit there, but just looking at this and you know getting right up close to it, the things that he was able to tell was amazing. Um, he said that you know for, for starters, um, we have uh, probably about a 14, 15 year old boy based on the pelvis uh, shape and based on the length of the bones, based on the closure of fissures of the um, the, the uh, joints. 
Um, he said that some of the bones were incredibly, um, at the, the joints, um, he had been worked incredibly heavy um, because all of the, the uh, joints and the attachment points for the muscle were really overdeveloped for a 15 year old. Um, he found a lot of evidence of um, really bad teeth, uh, he, the evidence of cavities, um, evidence of um, also something uh, they, they call um, a, tobac a tobacco pipe facet. They would have a, a clay tobacco pipe in their mouth for so long that um, it would wear down the teeth. And they've actually found skulls that have um, little uh, circles uh, around. One of the most common causes of death in the 17th century, a tooth facet. Now, it's odd that our boy is buried underneath trash in a cellar hole, artifacts dating from the same time period that the, the domestic trash is being thrown in. The other really compelling thing is that when he was buried, he's crammed into the side of a hole. His toes barely fit on the, the edge. I mean, they, they pushed him in. They put this, um, this fragment of a milk pan on top of him. And you can see from the way his arms are pushed in, he was pushed into the hole. Were they trying to hide something? What was going on that they had to put this body in the cellar hole, underneath where they lived, filled it with trash? I mean, what, what an incredible disregard for, for the you know, human life. Um, we also found evidence of his arm being really messed up. Um, one of the first things we started looking at was whether it was defensive wounds. Was he you know, de defending himself from something? Um, we found a archival reference from Virginia in the Virginia General Assembly about 1665. They had to pass a law. Now, generally they don't pass a law unless somebody's doing something bad, right? They passed a law that said, you people need to start giving your indentured servants a proper burial, a proper Christian burial. You can't just throw them out with the trash, is basically what this law said. So this was probably not an uncommon thing. We just happened to find the evidence of it at Levy Nat. Um, the end result, based on going back and forth with Doug Owsley, doing a lot of um, really interesting um, you know, magical science stuff, he did what they call an isotope analysis, where he identified that the bone structure had been created based on a diet of barley and not on a diet of corn. If you grew up here in the colonial Chesapeake, you grew up on corn. If you grew up in England, you grew up on barley. So this was reinforcing the road we're going down that he was probably an indentured servant. We found in, the, um, in one record that indicated that the owner of this property indeed had two indentured servants. We don't know what happened to them. We don't know their names. This, um, the, this story, The Body in the Basement, uh, has actually uh, just finished a seven year run at the Smithsonian and the Natural History Museum. Uh, they uh, you know, talked through that forensic story, the discovery, how we came up with it. Even based on the, the fact that he's you know, got a, a messed up arm, they determined that that was a post-mortem break. It was probably broken when he was pushed into the cellar hole after he was dead. And in fact, this poor indentured servant, who who knows how many years he had left to serve, died of a tooth abscess. Bummer. Now, the really cool part is that they did a full reconstruction. That's our boy. We named him Charlie. Um, we are going in about two weeks to pick Charlie up from the Smithsonian. And we are hoping in the next couple of years to develop an exhibit to talk about Providence have a permanent exhibit somewhere in the Annapolis area that will focus on you know, not only Charlie's story, but on all the other stories I've shared with you about Providence and the people that lived there and how they got their start in the 17th century Chesapeake that went on to, to bring us where we are today. Um, so the, uh, the, the journey has been interesting, learning about the 17th century, and it's not just about their buildings. It's so much more, and there are so many great stories that we still have to uncover. <coughs> If anybody wants to come help us uncover those stories, we welcome volunteers. So if you want to come play in the dirt in the spring, in the spring break, um, feel free to get in touch with us, and uh, we'd love to have the company. If you ever want to come to our lab, also, it's located in Edgewater um, at uh, the Colonial, um, at Historic London Town in Edgewater. It's a park, or an, our archaeology lab is open five days a week, so if anybody wants to come for a visit, you're more than welcome to. And I appreciate your, uh, your interest, and thanks for coming out. Anybody?
has any questions or you can. Uh, what town was, uh, what body of water was London Town? Uh, south River. South River. Yeah, it's on the south shore of South River. Um, and you can actually, from the South River, see the Annapolis Water Towers. Or, uh, uh, um, Greenbury Point Towers. Yeah. Uh, you didn't mention what type of wood they built those houses out. Uh, was it cypress or cedar? Um, cedar, white oak, um, uh, there's actually a, a whole, um, a whole, uh, laundry list of what type of, of wood is best for what parts of the building. So obviously like a cypress if you can get a hold of it but it's hard to get in this area. Um, any other kind of hard um, wood is going to be great for what they put actually in touch with the ground. They'd often coat it in tar to try to give it a little bit more um, you know, longevity. There were different types of um, wood that they would use that recommended for wood shingles. Um, so it, it was a variety. I mean, they really got to know the, the resources that were in their backyard and picked and, and you know, were able to pick and choose what the best wood was for each part of the building. So a very, very um, lot there. Good. To, like, do you, was there evidence, do you know anything about sawmills in the area? Um, not so much in the 17th century. Uh, most of the stuff that they're doing in the 17th century is uh, hand-hewn. They are doing it just by hard labor and with slave labor. Um, sawmills by the early 18th century, or um, early 19th century, when you get to like about 1820, when they start to have more like automated um, mills, the, it is unbelievable how many mills there are just dotting along the landscape. And any time you look at like a, a water course, if you see a water course and then some sort of little dam, it's not beavers that did it probably, it's probably a sawmill, you know, something that's water driven um, for a sawmill. Any other questions? What, um, what kind of Native American influence was there in the, in the area at that time? Um, at the time, you have the, uh, the Scataway tribes that are more in Southern Maryland, um, you know, out of the Pocahontas tradition, um, it, that, that, uh, that tribe. In Pennsylvania, you have the Susquehannock, um, Iroquoian uh, background. So you have the Algonquins to the south that are the Scataway and the Iroquoians to the top, um, to the north. Um, Anne Arundel County, we've sort of interpreted it as being a DMZ zone. <laughs> These guys were so at each other. When the Europeans came in and interjected themselves into the Native American politics, it got really interesting because there was a lot of, you know, well, if the, if the Seneca will come help me out, you know, we'll, we'll go and beat up on the Piscataway. And I mean, they're, they're, it becomes just a, 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 a soap opera. Um, but those are essentially the, the most um, influential uh, two tribes that were influencing and interacting with the um, Europeans at the time. Um, prob probably in Anne Arundel County, the heavier influence would be from the Algonquin and the Scataway. And artifacts related to that? Um, we have, uh, in, in Anne Arundel County, we've got over 1,500 archaeological sites. Of those, about half are Native American. Almost all of them have what we call a woodland um, artifact tradition or artifact from, from the woodland period, which dates up to right about the time of European contact. So um, we have village sites, we have short-term research procurement, oyster shell middens, things like that. Um, but it's it's everywhere. It's, it's all over the place if, if you know what you're looking for. Yeah. Could you please expand upon how a wood chimney would have been built so as not to catch fire? Okay, have you ever seen a, um, a, a short sort of uh, um, a paling fence or a fence that would keep chickens in? It, it's, you basically have um, very thin wood that's woven back and forth through uprights. What they would do is create that, that's the uh, wattle part of it. Then they would take raw clay, just like they would use if they had the resources and time to make brick uh, squares. They would use that same soft clay and they would smear it on the inside of that wood. And they would let it, essentially they'd start the fire and let it do a slow bake. And every time some of it would fall off, they'd let the fire go out, they'd smear more on. And eventually you end up with something that's like really thick. You get you know, a, a really thick, uh, um, essentially a, a continuous <coughs> uh, brick type clay material that's fired in place. Um, but once you get a huge chunk that falls off, you've got a raging fire, it doesn't always work. You really, it's a lot of maintenance. Yeah. And what was the makeup of the Providence community? Was it all religious? Because I know they had a battle at one time. So yeah. Um, so so primarily, um, the, the first residents of Providence were these, um, the, these uh, Puritan, very devout Puritans. They decided that the Puritans that were down in Virginia were not quite devout enough. So they were coming up here um, to, uh, to essentially have a little bit more freedom for their religious um, activities. 
But very quickly, um, now at, at the time she mentioned uh, there was a battle. The Battle of the Severn in 1655 was the only battle on American soil that was a part of the English Civil War, when the Catholics and Protestants were at each other. So essentially what happens is the um, Providence settlers, they start getting really powerful. They have all these amazing resources. They are politically connected. They become a little too big for their britches. The Catholics come up and try to um, you know, settle them down a little bit. There's a battle. Um, several people died. There was an execution of at least three people. But the Protestants won. And they took over temporary control of the government, of what was the Catholic government. Um, and that lasted until essentially word got back that the Civil War was over. You should let it be now from England. And then things kind of settled down in the 1660s. Um, but it really created a, a, a Protestant um, a, a Protestant influence that, that never really went away. Yeah. Um, you said that there were few women, comparatively speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, what can you tell us about the role of women? Um, the, the thing that I am continually amazed by is that, you know, in, in your fifth grade history, you find, you, you hear that, okay, women didn't have a lot of, of power or control. They couldn't own property. They didn't, you know, have a lot to, to work with. When you really start looking at the women in the Chesapeake area, all of the traditional roles have been thrown out the window because it is a matter of life and death. It is pure desperation that you have to figure out how to make something work or you're going to die. So what you tend to see in the Chesapeake area, and we've got so many wonderful examples of women who figure that out and they run with it and they do amazing things. They own property. They make really important decisions. They are incredibly influential. But it just doesn't make it into the written record. But we start to see, you know, a woman that you know has has her fingers into a million different properties, and and like I, I did that example early on, the woman who strategically married up the chain until she was married to the wealthiest man, and then oh look, he died. Perfect. You know, <laughs> it, it was, <laughs> I mean, it, it's amazing when you start to look at those stories. They they used the opportunities that, and, and really in a way changed the dynamic because once you gave them, once they had that power that they took themselves, it changed the dynamic for where, you know, where, where women's roles were in, in the, uh, you know, in the coming centuries. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I wonder if you can pretty much translate what you've been finding in Runway County to out here, so especially like Dorchester County. Mm -hmm. Um, researching some ancestors and they came over at that time yeah. period and I wonder and I wonder also if there's anything going on like that over here. Um, not very much. Um, there's probably more research on 17th century um, to the, the, some of the northern counties. Um, Tabo County's got, got a good bit um, uh, up near Chestertown. You've got some interesting 17th century sites up there. Um, in, on the eastern shore, you don't tend to have as strong of a, an archaeological protection in a development context. It's more out of universities and more of a conventional or, or traditional research um, venue. So you don't quite have the same, um, you know, the same uh, emphasis on, on researching and finding those sites. But there are a ton of them. The other really interesting thing is that we think of ourselves in terms of counties and the bay is this huge barrier. I mean, until the Bay Bridge, it was, you know, that side and that side. Um, what we tend to see in, in the archival records from the 17th century, they, if somebody bought a big, uh, or you know, patented a big parcel in Anne Arundel County, invariably when they die, you see in their probate inventory references to their plantation on Kent Island, their plantation in Somerset. They are so interconnected, and you know, a, a thousand-acre farm is nothing in, in their mind because it's just it's so open and, and in a way, you know, almost free. It's so easy to get land in those first early years. So there are a ton of connections, and we see, you know, people basically in Anne Arundel County in the 17th century. We see their their families migrate over to the eastern shore. So lots of interconnections in the 17th century. And they just didn't see the bay as big of a barrier. They saw it all as one big, um, you know, big playland for them to buy more property. Yeah. Can you ex explain the process of the decay of a house that would explain why these artifacts landed in these appropriate places? You know, this, were the houses abandoned? I mean, why would why yeah. would curtain rings end up? being 
next to the window where the curtain was. Mm -hmm. Okay. Were they um, abandoned intact, and then some of them were abandoned intact. Some of them were um, were uh, reused for a different purpose. Um, the Sparrows Rest site that had the window lens from 1671. That site, for example, once they finished using that as a primary structure and they built the big mansion that was in the background, on the top layers of soil, we found a ton of, um, of horse bridles, um, furniture for, for tack. Um, it clearly was adapted and used as a stable or some sort of, of animal um, shelter after they weren't living there anymore. But as we dig down through the soil, what, what tends to happen is um, if you know, something gets uh, dropped or, or deposited, just natural attrition of the soil come the layers over top of it, and it starts to build up. And it's digging down through those layers where it, we're able to you know, break it up into time and go back through time as we go down through the soil, we're able to attribute those curtain rings are next to artifacts from the, the 17th century, so we attribute the curtain ring to that time period. If you go another six inches up, we might find a ceramic from the 19th century next to a horse bit that tells us that the horse bit was in use in the 19th century. And it's surprising how um, the, the levels of soil are, are easily distinguished when, when that happens. The other thing that we tend to find when um, looking at the distributions to be able to identify where was a window, where was a door, um, most of these sites were plowed at some point through the last couple hundred years. And when we dig the, what we call the plow zone, the first six, eight, ten inches of soil, it's all churned up. And it is very often mixed up with you know, something modern, can be right next to something from the 17th century. But when we start to do um, the, the distribution analysis using a program called SURFER, it essentially creates a topographic map showing the highs and lows, we're able to do statistical assessment, you know, statistical modeling that allows us to focus that, you know, where exactly it was the 17th century, even though it's in a mixed context. So we, we essentially are able to do quite a bit of that from the, the computer model. It sounds like it implies that when somebody drops something, they just left it there. <laughs> um, that's why you, you rarely find coins. People don't pick up stuff that's valuable, <laughs> or that's not valuable. But if you if you drop a quarter, you tend to go and pick it up. If you drop a penny, not so much. <laughs> so it it you know it becomes a question of you know how it was deposited. Did they know they dropped it? Um, with the broken ceramics, um, that, that tends to be something, if you broke, you, you'll find dense uh, kitchen bins that just are, are chock-a-block full of organic material, animal bone, broken ceramics. You, if you broke a plate, you didn't have a, a trash you know, trash pickup. You, you had a pit out back that was the trash pit. So they didn't have glues to repair things? Um, Instead of glues, what they what we have found are ceramics that have um, very delicate holes drilled in, and they sew the ceramics back together. They're, they're using it for dry dry goods. Um, they're able to to reuse. Yeah. 